Study three, defending the truth and preparing for the future. It's going to be a very interesting uh, study this afternoon, brethren and sisters. And uh, by the time we finish, I think you'll see that we with the Colossians are engaged together. So then, uh, what we want to do is just pick up from where we left off, uh, basically uh, from last time. But we do want to look at Paul's concern and advice for the Colossians, preparing for the defence of their faith. Now, I think by this time we're all getting the idea. Number one, we are expecting the return of our Lord Jesus Christ any time as prophecy shows us. Secondly, we need to be aware of what our Lord Jesus Christ will be looking for in us. And of course, as the Apostle Paul has said to the Colossians, it is Christ in you, the hope of glory, which is, of course, God manifestation. So we're coming here to uh, chapter 2, and uh, verses 1 to 7, just, just a brief overview. Um, we are indicating, brethren and sisters, that when the Apostle Paul from Rome wrote this letter to the Colossians, he was working on impact. In other words, they get the message. They do something about it. And basically, that's how the letter comes through to us. Uh, because we saw that the Apostle Paul was speaking to Christadelphians, brethren in Christ. And we emphasise the word in because we should be as the body of Christ joined to him as the head who has full control of that body. So we'll see that theme continuing to come. Now, at chapter 2, verse 1, Paul apologised for the ecclesia as they... Uh, so Paul agonised for the ecclesia as they faced doctrinal challenge. Now, he, he, he was with them. He agonised with them. Verse 2, he encouraged them to be strong together in the spirit of love. In Christ, they had all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge needed for salvation. They didn't need anything extra. Subtle and plausible reasoning would assail them. <laughs> We're going to see that. And then verse 5, they needed to preserve the order and unity and a commitment in their ranks. And that, brothers and sisters, is important, which we'll make a, a comment about shortly. Now, just picking up in, uh, in verse 3, so we're looking at uh, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 3, and it says, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, what he's basically pointing out here is that in Christ, who is preeminent, the preeminent one is found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge needed for salvation. You don't need to go outside of that looking for the philosophers of this world, the Gnostics and, uh, the, and, and the, all the others. The treasures in Christ Chica. are hidden from unbelief. Even the believer must know Christ intimately and search to enter into them. So that we are uh, basically told there in, in the Proverbs, they must be dug up with energy and purpose. Now, Proverbs chapter 2, I'll just read this for you. Um, by the way, these, uh, these um, data slides can be made available at the end of this uh, 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 special effort. So if you haven't got everything down, it, it won't matter. Now, Proverbs chapter 2. We read, if, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of Yahweh and find the knowledge of God. What it's telling us, brothers and sisters, that we have to, as it were, get the shovels and picks out and start digging. None of these things come at the push of the button and pop up automatically, way, and your heart 
and your mind is transformed. No, no, no. It's hard work. Right. Now, brothers and sisters, we have a very special privilege. We are attached to our Lord Jesus Christ in status. He is the preeminent one. And in him we will find all the answers that we need with the Colossians confronting the enemy. Now, when we are digging, we dig up, as it were, from Proverbs, knowledge. Knowledge is an understanding of the secret of God. And wisdom, brethren and sisters, is the application of knowledge in living and defending the truth. Knowledge. That knowledge, brethren and sisters, involves something which is absolutely unique to Christadelphians in Colossae or even here. <laughs> and it's simply understanding the principle of God manifestation. Right. And you will speak to people who want to believe in the Trinity, people who have all kinds of weird ideas other than understanding the principle that God intended to manifest himself in his son and then to extend that into the body of his son. And we are very privileged to be a part of that. So now, yes, the Apostle Paul, preparing for the defence of their faith. Paul was strongly with them. He was with them. Though over in Rome, he knew the battle was coming. He's an experienced warrior, if you like. And he was strongly with them in spirit and was encouraged by their steadfast faith in Christ. So he knew, he knew as it were, that they were a good band of troops and his spirit was with them. Okay, now he starts to think about military terms. As a military man, Paul inspects the troops and he's looking for order, an orderly or regular arrangement of each in their place and steadfastness, that which is established and confirmed as the flanks of solidarity. Paul saw the Colossians, brethren and sisters, standing true to the word of God and each other. Now, this is the way that Paul thinks. He said similar words to the Philippians. You listen to this. This is Philippians 1. 27, 28, he says, only let your conversation, that means your whole way of life, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs. Now listen to this, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing being terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Brothers and sisters, what the Apostle Paul is really concerned about is the unity of the ecclesia. He wants to know that they're standing in order. They are standing together and they are well protected from any direction. And they are prepared, brothers and sisters, to support one another, as uh, he says to the Philippians, with one mind. That's going to be interesting when we see the outworking of this. They are preparing for the defence of their faith. In verse 6 he says, As the gospel of Christ, uh, Jesus the Lord, was taught to the Colossians by Epaphras, so they should continue to walk in that way. <clears throat> to walk is an action of progress. It's going forward. They should go on acknowledging the Lordship of Christ, who is all sufficient for their salvation. And so the apostle speaking to the Ephesians, he says, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice a to God for a sweet-smelling savour. And I just mentioned at this time that Paul's writing to the Colossians is a twin sister, as it were, to that which he wrote to the Ephesians. 
those two books come together. And, uh, and he sees issues very similar and he responds in the same way. So what we now find in verse 7, their faith should be anchored downwards like the roots of a tree and rise up in maturity like the walls of a building on the foundation of Christ. And this should be done in a spirit of thankfulness for something they were unable to do for themselves. And we mentioned in our first study that thankfulness is a primary idea or theme in this book because he's telling them all about what God has done for them, what Christ has done for them, and what he's continuing himself to do. Things which they could not achieve themselves. Hence, be thankful. And we are here, brothers and sisters, because of a work of God through Christ in us. And so uh, he, he says to the Ephesians that they were built upon the foundation of the apostles and of the prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth up unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. A habitation of God through the Spirit. In other words, brethren and sisters, in our application to the Word of God, we are, as it were, fellowshipping the Father in our midst. And he is pleased, as it were, in that sense, to dwell among us. Now, a verse 8. Beware of the dangers of proud philosophers who will make a spoil of you. So now we're getting closer to the conflict. <clears throat> And they are plausible advocates of worldly values and Jewish traditions, not of Christ. So we find then that he's basically saying what you need to do is understand your enemy. So then we, uh, we, we read here at verse 9, God has fully manifested in the Lord Jesus Christ has been fully manifested in the Lord Jesus. Therefore, Greek mythology and its appeal is irrelevant. So you can wipe that one off because our God has manifested himself in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 10, they are complete in Christ who is preeminent above all, all rulership and power. This is an answer to the Gnostics. Their exclusiveness, their expectations of power. It's an answer to the, the Gnostics. Other forms of hierarchy are not necessary. And so we find then uh, in, um, in, in uh, 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 let's see, in uh, Ephesians and chapter 4, he, he, he says this to the Ephesians. He says, that we henceforth, or oh, listen to this. So he's writing to the Ephesians, but they're twins to the Colossians, and they're both facing enemies, hence that's why they shared these letters. He says that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. This world, brethren and sisters, as we'll see shortly, is full of the winds of apostasy and humanism. And Paul says, don't get tossed around. Okay, well, we'll listen to him. He says, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That's exactly what we see in this world today. Okay, we won't get caught in that just at the <coughs> moment. But Paul went on to say, but speaking the truth in love, we grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Can you see the similarity of themes? So he's talking about the body growing up into the head and being aware of the contrary winds of doctrine. And then, of course, we know that uh, he goes on to say that, speaking of the head, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by now that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, 
maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, <laughs> all of that boils down, brethren and sisters, if you look at this carefully, <laughs> what the Apostle Paul is telling them is that every single member of your ecclesia, now he's talking to the Colossians, but he might as well be talking to us, every member of the ecclesia is important. Everyone. Now you take a body, okay, it has parts. This is what Paul's saying. And it has muscle, it has bone, it has ligaments, it has parts that move and parts that don't. But they are all important and they contribute to the building up of that body and preserving it in health and strength and joined into the head. That's the message. Colossians, can you get this? Because unfortunately, brothers and sisters, in their case, and Paul knew this, the head had come off the body. And when that happens, the body becomes uncontrollable. So then we come down to just our, our comment here in the emphasised box. And we're just reading Second Corinthians 10 verse 4. Well, he's told them that they're complete in Christ. He has the answers for everything. Now, I told you the other night to come along today with your spears, your swords and your shields. Don't see anybody with them. <laughs> but the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 4, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, to throw them away, which is you've got the message long before you came, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. So it's God through Christ and the power of his word manifest in them which will tear down the strongholds of opposition. Okay. So verses 11 to 13, the, the issue of circumcision. They had received true circumcision in Christ other procedures by men were not needed. So they did not need to emphasise circumcision. So then in Galatians 5 and verse 2, which we have now on the screen, Paul says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Ooh, imagine a Jew hearing that back in the days of the Apostle and of the Colossians. For in Christ, in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Faith which works by love. Well then, in Christ, they've been cut free from the body devoted to a life of sin. You know, brothers and sisters, if we're all sitting here having been baptised, We've gone through a certain procedure, but it wasn't with a knife. It was with the sharpness of the Spirit Word of God. And we have been cut free from a body devoted, as it were, to a life of sin. So Paul then, picking this up, in Romans 2, he says, For he is not a Jew, oh, okay, Colossians, he's not a Jew, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. <coughs> so you see, it's all about the mind and the heart and its translation into our works. So he's not a Jew which is one outward. Now, at the, this time in Colossae, the, the emphasis was very strongly upon the ceremonial of circumcision. And if you had been not circumcised, then, of course, we know how it runs. You've got no hope of the kingdom. Well, the Apostle Paul is saying he's a Jew, but truly, which is one inwardly circumcised and in the heart and spirit and not in the letter. Okay. Now, just continuing that on in verse 10, Paul would have them understand, and he would have us understand, brothers and sisters, that by their baptism, 
they had identified with Christ. With him they died and were buried to the old world and its values and with him by faith in the working of God through resurrection they have risen to a new way of life in anticipation of a new world to come. That's the process. Being severed from the old world, they were now joined to Christ and are reconciled, uh, are recognised in him. Now, brethren and sisters, circumcision began with Abraham. He and his wife could not bear children. And God told him that we have to work together. And he was going to teach him a lesson that God's family, who were involved in that marvellous promise that he was given, <coughs> was not going to be the product of Abraham and his wife, a natural seed. He was telling Abraham that I, Yahweh, will be the father of my family. And you will remember this by that little mark of circumcision upon each of the male of his household. So that's what it means. It means that Yahweh is the father of his family. Aha! Uh -huh. How is that so? How is that begettal achieved? Well, the Apostle Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1 that we are begotten again by the incorruptible seed of the word. That's the working of the Father. And as that word goes in, so there's a process of creating a new person. And he points out that it happens to be an incorruptible seed which belongs to God. So then we move on. In verse 13, through the forgiveness of all trespasses, they had been quickened with Christ out of a state of uncircumcision uh, uh, and sin. Well, that, that, is, that is a marvellous process, brothers and sisters. You know, just, just at the moment, uh, uh, oh, continuing now, well, I, I've been engaged in tutoring an, an, a, a 92-year-old Catholic, a woman, who for most of her year has been bound to the Catholic system. And she has relatives who talk to her about the Bible. And she decided, brothers and sisters, that she wanted to learn the Bible. And I happened to be called in to help her do exactly that. Well, after about three or four sessions, the spirit power of the word of God began to work. <laughs> and she told me, after probably at least 80 odd years of Catholicism, that she'd thrown out of her house every item of Catholicism, including literature. It's all gone. And she wanted to take me into her house to show that it was exactly so. That kind of thing, brethren and sisters, is the power of the word of God. And having continued on in our course of instruction, she's changed her tune. She started to say, I want to learn the Bible. Now she's saying to me, I want to be baptised. And at Enfield we are faced with the practical ramifications of putting a 92-year-old former Catholic through the baptismal bath. But she wants to do it. And that's the power of God. And it's an incorruptible seed. What a, a marvellous testimony, brothers and sisters. Now, coming to verse 14. Observance of ritual law ceased on the cross. So ordinance of the law, which were handwritten, only severed served rather to hinder them, but are now taken out of the way, being nailed to the cross with Christ, which is what the Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter 2.24. He said, 
who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye are healed. Now, brethren and sisters, it was our previous classes to try and appreciate the price that God had paid for us to be here as it were today. He put his son through an enormous trial. And Isaiah commenting on that said that his, his, his face, his appearance was more deformed than any man. And by his blood we have been reconciled to God. Well, through that process, as Peter says, he nailed our sins to that cross. Now, he had no sins of his own. He was taking us, as it were, up into the cross, the bearers of human nature, and nailed it to the cross and destroyed it. But he himself, brothers and sisters, had to go in to that grave in the process because he was telling the world that his father is righteous. And his father deemed, right from the Garden of Eden, that there was no good thing in flesh, even in a sinless man. And down into the grave it went, but God was wonderfully faithful because three days later, the Lord was the firstborn of a new creation. He'd come out of that grave. So then, moving on, verse 15. In the triumph of his death and resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ has won in himself a victory over their foes, the Jewish and Gentile elite who took him to the extremity of of trial. Well, he'd, he'd won. Now, I'm just going to, to uh, uh, read this to you, brothers and sisters. Here's our Lord. We are up on the cross with him. And the apostle Paul records this in Hebrews 12 and verses 2 and 3. He says that Jesus was looking, that, uh, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied in your faith, uh, uh, wearied and, uh, and faint in your minds. So you see, it was for the joy that was set before him. He went through that Oh, amazing, amazing affliction. So then, <clears throat> in that process, of course, he destroyed him that had the power of death, uh, that is the diabolos, which is sin-prone human nature. That's our problem. He had it. He was tempted in all points like unto us, but he conquered it. He never sinned. In us. But he went through this whole process for us. He was up there for us. And we have to, brethren and sisters, identify with him. So we read here on our screen, as a conqueror, he put them to open shame. In this he has made the Colossians free from all observant of uh, the rituals of the law. But, of course, the point he makes is that we must follow him now. And uh, <coughs> uh, that, that's important for us, isn't it? That Christ has gone before he has set the example. He has destroyed the problem that we have and now we must follow him. <clears throat> and the Apostle Paul, of course, has described for us how we do that when he says that we need to crucify the flesh with its lusts and affections and uh, we endeavour to do that in the spirit of which he has given. Now, verse 16, that they were not to be judged and, con uh, and con uh, coerced into making a difference in food and drink, keeping of holy days, observance of the new moon, keeping of the Sabbath. These were rituals that the Jews believed were essential for salvation. So then, in verse 17, these observances of the Jewish law are but a shadow of 
the one that has come. And our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, said that the law, as we read down here in Galatians 3.24 at the bottom of the screen, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith, not by ceremonies and keeping of other ordinances. So then, these observances of Jewish law are but a shadow and therefore they, they need to know that the substance has indeed come. Now, <clears throat> other doctrinal errors are named. Do not be judged by heretics into losing your inheritance through skillful rhetoric, premeditated and professed humility. Oh, they, these fellows are very good actors. They, they can create their own appearance, as it were, of humility. And Paul says, do not be persuaded either that angels, mediators of the old law, continue in this role above the need of Christ. Now, it was the worship of angels, Paul says, that severed the head. And this is how it happened, that when they were to approach unto Almighty God, they believed that first of all, you had to go through your special angel angel worship as they were mediators in times of old so they say they still are so where does that leave them as the body and christ with the father as the head they've severed it so we read in first timothy 2 and verse 5 where paul says there is one god and one mediator between god and men and that is the man Christ Jesus. There is no angels involved. <laughs> and therefore the head is engaged with the body. So we now find, don't be deceived by the profession of visions, connecting to things indescribable, the knowledge of which are deemed essential for salvation. This is special knowledge. This, brethren and sisters, is Gnosticism. This is the kind of special knowledge you just don't have, but we do, and therefore we are preeminent, we are important, and so on. Such professions are the product of human pride, fantasy, and carnal thinking. They had to understand that. Now, we did look at this uh, graphic on our first occasion. Do not be severed from the head of the ecclesial body. Such Jewish heretics are not part of the body of Christ, which is unified, nourished, guided, cared for, and identified uh -huh, from the head, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then, in Ephesians 4, 15, he says, but speaking the truth in love, you may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So they were nourished, they were knit together through its joints and ligaments, growing with a growth that is from God. And that's the point we made a little bit earlier on. Brethren and sisters, every single one of us are part of that body, contributing to its well-being and to its ability to withstand, as Paul said, the contrary winds of doctrine. Okay, so there's a personal challenge. Paul is saying in verse 23, examine yourselves. See if we are fitting into the body as we should. Self-imposed ascetic denials of the body, assumed for feigned humility or feigned humility and self-prescribed worship may be mistaken for profound wisdom. And this leads, brothers and sisters, to the possibility of competitiveness. So this person comes along in the ecclesia and says, oh, I did this and then I cut up the da 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 and somebody else comes along and they try to do better. And so you finish up with a competition. This turns out to not be self-imposed ascetic denials. It becomes a playground for, uh, for achievement and pride. So these are human-centered behaviors by which a man believes he can achieve a higher state of loneliness. It, it, it's, it's really salvation by works. However, despite the outward appearance, they are of no value in checking 
the passions and lusts and indulgence of the foolish was counterproductive. Such pious demonstrations are only God-denying and self-satisfying. So that's basically what he's trying to tell him. Okay. Can you see that? Watch what comes in 2024. Brothers and sisters, we've been sitting down with the Colossians. Now we are going fast forward. And we have zoomed up to 2024. And we want to make some of these issues that we've just been through real, meaningful. Now the reference there in, in Revelation 22 and, 20, uh, and verse 12, And behold, says the Lord, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his works shall be. Consider yourself. Okay. 2024. This is what we saw. This world, brothers and sisters, is being swept with a policy and agenda and a poison, a, 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 an intellectual poison, if you like, called humanism, the new humanism, or postmodernism, which is expressed in a significant group of Christians called progressive Christianity. Now look at the staircase here for a start. We start at the top. We're Christians. But then we take a step down and we say the Bible is not infallible. Then we go a step further. Man is not made in God's image. And there's no such things as miracles, no virgin birth, no deity, no atonement, no resurrection. Uh -huh. Well, I'm a agnostic. No, I'm not. I'm an atheist. That's the downward decline we are seeing in this world. Christianity, for example, in a country that was once known to be Christian, America is declining radically. Because the winds, the contrary winds of doctrine are blowing. Okay, so let's have a look at this comment here. Progressive Christianity, as described by its adherents, is characterised by a willingness to question tradition, Ooh. acceptance of human diversity, a strong emphasis on social justice and care for the poor and the oppressed and environmental stewardship of this earth. Right. That's it. Well, yeah. a willingness to question tradition. One of their slogans is cancel culture. That's all about getting rid of the past because these people have woke up. <laughs> The past is irrelevant and what's before them is all new and they set the terms of that. So, acceptance of human diversity. Mm -hmm. Well, the wokeism that we're talking about here, brethren and sisters, mm -hmm. is the common croaking of the frogs of Revelation 16. It's a modern revolution. Mm -hmm. Now, our Revelation 16 starts with the French Revolution and coming out of the French Revolution was liberty, equality, fraternity. And today the frogs are telling us all about diversity, equity and inclusivity. Just different names for the same thinking. And what God has told us through his word has exactly come to pass. Now we go on and say there's a strong emphasis on social justice. That means that all kinds of people, I'm not going to go into details for maybe your conscience sake, but you know the perverse kind are now to be recognised as equal and therefore to be included. 
And you probably will know that of recent times the Pope has stood up in front of the world. Yes, the Pope. And he says that certain kind of people are not sinners. And more than that, certain other kind of people who get married are to be blessed. And he's got the world in turmoil, at least the traditional Catholic bishops. That's the way it's all going. Okay, let's get serious. The progressive Christians, brethren and sisters, have ten commandments of their own. Cancel culture, get rid of the past, here's the new. Right, here we go. Number one, commandment number one. Jesus is a model for living more than an object for worship. In other words, he's just a good man, but he's not the son of God. Number two, affirming people's potential is more important than reminding them of their brokenness or their sinfulness. Number three, the work of reconciliation should be valued over making judgments. You don't pass judgments on anyone. You just go for reconciliation. Gracious behaviour is more important than right belief. Interesting. Inviting questions is more valuable than supplying answers. Encouraging the personal search is more important than group uniformity. In other words, brothers and sisters, don't bother about conforming and learning from the body of Christ. You go your own way. You determine your own uh, laws. Whoops, sorry, coming back. Um, Okay, number seven. Meeting actual needs is more important than maintaining the institution. In other words, it's all about self. doesn't matter about the rest of you. It's self. Number eight. Peacemaking is more important than power. Number nine, we should care more about love and less about sex. Number ten, life in this world is more important than than the afterlife. Eat, drink and be merry, said the Apostle Paul, didn't he? Well, <clears throat> those things, brothers and sisters, have a meaning. That's how they're basically stated. This is progressive Christianity. This is modern Christendom. Okay, well, let's see how we go. Number one and two. Jesus is just a good moral teacher as the Son of Man. His divinity as the Son of God is taken out of the picture. Okay, now I'm just going to tell you something. (coughs) When you take God out of the picture... And the Lord Jesus Christ is just a man. Yes, I think. Just. Then we don't see him anymore as at the right hand of the Father as our intercessor. So we don't bother to end our prayers acknowledging in and through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, the affirmation of human potential and the discount of sin is... Uh, it is humanistic moralism. In other words, you can do as you like. Number three, a focus less on relationship with God and more on humans relating to humans. Christians need to stop judging and start helping. So we have all these soft and gentle little words about looking after one another. Forget about God. It's all human level. Okay. Number four, it's not what we believe, but how we behave. People who care about studying the Bible are like Pharisees, divisive, narrow, mean, but not gracious. Interesting. Number five, asking questions conveys humility and suggests equality. Absolute knowledge is question and Bible truth is doubt. Look at the way that humanism is drifting. That's in this world. This is pretty strong. Progressive Christianity, brothers and sisters, is a very big movement, particularly now in America, but it's going far and wide. You look at number six. 
Religion is about humans finding God on their own terms rather than God calling them through his word. Absolute truth is surpassed by self-determination. Pure moralism, number seven, a horizontal perspective and charity organisation focused on social ills but never looking up to worship and glorify God. See, it's all about taking God out of the picture. <laughs> it's pure humanism. Now, church leadership. Okay, imagine you're arranging brethren. Church leadership should pursue peace as a humble and sacrificial service. Peace. Such authority is not for command and control. It's for peace among people, not for doctrinal authority, but moral virtue. So we break down the importance of that kind of leadership. Now, this one here is stunning. Moral and sexual permissiveness is acceptable in view of good and loving people. In other words, when all this immorality is, is occurring, it's telling us it's acceptable, provided that the motive is love. Wow, what, what, what a scenario for abominable immorality that's probably pretty much here now, but it's going to come more and more. So we, we, we see here that despite God's moral commandments, being nice justifies the action. God is indifferent in view of human needs and circumstances. And finally, 10. Now listen to this one. A focus on man instead of God, discounting doctrines for moralistic practices and fixing present problems and avoiding the future unknown. You live for now. And God's out of the picture. So there we have it. So where's this world heading? What are other contrary winds of doctrines? Well, among progressives, belief in God has collapsed. And I mentioned that, and it's collapsing and collapsing. But what is also coming alongside of that is AI, artificial intelligence, is creating its own religion, and it's writing its own Bible. And the Chinese are now leading in that endeavour so that they can give their Christians a new Bible. <laughs> and you can imagine what's in that. And that by they will destroy, brothers and sisters, uh, Christianity. Now we're moving on to just the last little bit. In verse 1 of chapter 3, or 1 to 4 of chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, look, in view of all these things, set your mind on things above. Now, what we've just been through, coming up to 2024, we've got to get our minds up above. And therefore, since you were raised with Christ through baptism, we've cut away from the world all that kind of, of rubbish and we've been raised into, as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 7, raised into the heavenlies with Christ. And that's what we've been saying. The moral consequence, brethren and sisters, of our baptism is a newness of life. And where is that? Well, it's in heaven with Christ, but it's manifest on the earth in terms of reality. So, Christ sits on the right hand of God. That's what he says. The position of honour and power is actually referring back to Psalm 110. The preeminence of Christ is described like in Matthew 28 where he tells his disciples that God has given him all power in heaven and in earth. And Psalm 110 verse 4, he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, through whom we draw nigh unto God. See, these are all contrary to what we've just been through. And then he says, he is the only mediator between God and man. There is no case for angel worship. So just, just looking at this concept, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ yes. in God. That's an amazing verse, brothers and sisters, 
as the antitypical high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ bears us close to his heart in love and he takes us into the presence of God as signified under the law of Moses on the Day of Atonement. So it is then that this was enacted when the high priest entered the most holy place wearing the ephod on which was bound on his breast the plate of judgment, the breastplate of judgment. And attached to that were the 12 stones representing the Israel of God awaiting consummation of their eternal salvation. Now that was the type in the law on the Day of Atonement. Our Lord Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, is the, uh, is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So that we read in Hebrews 9 verse 24 from the Apostle Paul, For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. But he says, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. That's the ESV translation. So then, our Lord Jesus Christ bears us, as it were, before the Father. And they were now to focus their minds and hearts on Christ. Heavenly values, brothers and sisters, will now translate into earthly practice. That's the whole idea. Love not the world and lay not tre up treasures on earth, because our life is as it were in heaven. Now ye are dead, so he says in verse 3. That's the old man. He's been crucified. He's gone under the water. They were dead from the rudiments of the world. He that is dead is free from sin, says the Apostle Paul. Uh, and of course in time past, you had walked after the old ways of the old man. Now your life, you know, the new man, is hidden with Christ. <laughs> ah, he's safe and concealed. He's not recognised by the world. He is to be hidden by a covering, which is the atonement, a, a, a covering provided for us in baptism. <coughs> so we were baptised into Christ and we have put all cross. We are hidden and we are with him as it were in heaven. So then, putting on Christ brings a moral consequence. It's a putting on of a new man. Now, uh, just to, uh, uh, to, to finish this off, <laughs> your life is hidden with Christ in God. <laughs> this is all heavenly description in him. We live and move and have our being, said the Apostle Paul. This speaks of empowerment for life. This is speaking of eternal life. God gives life and immortality. And we are just simply awaiting the day when what we live in status now will become reality. And that's the point that Paul's making. So Christ, who is our life, hence to be inseparably united to him, it is the Christ life that is expressed. Well, we have in Philippians 3 and verse 20. And I'm going to just try and read this one if I can find it uh, because I think it's so, so good. Here we go. Now, listen to this. This is the Apostle Paul. This is talking about the, the present. He says this. He says, Your conversation which means a whole way of life, is in heaven. In heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So our whole way of life is in heaven. We are looking for the Lord Jesus Christ, who, he says, shall change our body of humiliation. So translations call it a vile body, but it's a body of humiliation. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working, whereby he's able even to subdue all things unto himself. So you see, it's all the same terms. And, of course, uh, the Apostle Paul lived the Christ-like life. So when he shall appear, you shall be like him, coming in power and great glory. What is developed now, brethren and sisters, is hidden, but this will be revealed in the future. This, the spiritual presence, the present, will become future glorious reality. We shall be like him, for we see him as he is, said the Apostle John. So then, uh, we really close on this now that having clearly shown the Colossians the heavenly associations of their life in Christ, ours likewise, Paul now describes the implications in terms of human conduct. Despite the fact that they belong to Christ, who is at God's right hand, believers exist on earth, and we live this life, as it were, in status. The characteristics which were normal in their former way of life on earth and which gave such displeasure to God must now be eliminated from their lives. Is all a part of that process. The old man is dead. Paul therefore enjoins uh, various duties in different relations of life, which they ought to perform in such a way as to show that true religion had a controlling influence over their hearts. Now, what is going to happen, brethren and sisters, in these following final sessions, including the exhortation tomorrow, is the Apostle Paul is going to clearly define in practical terms what a heavenly life <laughs> is all about on earth <laughs> and how we can manifest our Lord Jesus Christ, Christ in you. But we need to have that definition. We need to have it spelled out as it were before us. The Colossians needed that. And so the Apostle Paul will continue to do it in these final chapters. And God willing, we'll try and follow them out.